What's the difference between these amazing humanoids and the rest of us? The difference is that not only are they hungry, they're humble, which makes them coachable. Tom Brady, clearly, if you just look at his body type, he can't outrun you, he can't outjump you, he can't outlift you, but you can't catch him. The difference is you can measure how much he can bench, you can measure how high he can jump, how fast he can do a 40, but you can't measure this and you can't measure his heart. The greatest enemy you have ever faced in your life is fear and self-doubt. Conquering the world in your own dome. That's the challenge. If the enemy within can't stop you, nothing can. The ability to understand how to let go of yesterday's baggage is part of an art form. If you're afraid to fail, you're afraid to succeed. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. My guest today is performance coach Greg Hardin. Now, I know when we hear the word performance coach, we think automatically sports. So yes, Greg has worked with people like Desmond Howard, Michael Phelps, Tom Brady, to name a few. But his latest book, How to Stay Sane in an Insane World, is really a conversation about us becoming an expert on who we are. Because then we can bring that anywhere. We can be a better friend or a better parent or a better lover, or yes, a better CEO or a better athlete. So he's taken his practices that he used with addicts and alcoholics and professional athletes and broken down a ton of ideas on how we can manage our inner voice. For example, stop being afraid of being afraid. Greg Hardin, welcome to the show. I'm excited to talk to you today. I'm excited to talk to you about a lot of things, and I'm going to use your book, Stay Sane in an Insane World, as our launching off point. Um, you know, people love to hear people's resumes. And so we'll just cut to the chase and say that you've worked with some of the greatest athletes in the world, athletes like Michael Phelps and Tom Brady, just to name a few. So if we, if we need to establish that right from the top, there it is. Um, I, I'm, I'm always more interested in the content, but people love to know how it's taken place in the 3D world. So we'll, we'll give them that. I, I first am most curious into how you got into the field of performance. <laughs> That's a great question because I, it was not a plan. Uh, I'll tell anyone that God has a sense of humor. I thought I thought I was a peak performer, found out I was not, and then I ended up becoming an, a so-called expert. And what it really happened was that I was working at a uh, hospital-based program, working with alcoholics and addicts. Um, since I segued from dreaming of being in radio, television, and film, and being the Black Bruce Lee. I, I, <laughs> Wait, what do, you, uh, I, wait, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? Like well, you wanted to get I, into a performance in the in in front of the camera and do all of that? Absolutely. And I was I was real clear that you needed to be in front of the camera and in back of the camera if you really wanted to tell stories. If you really wanted to be someone that was conveying stories, you had to be able to uh, produce, direct, and if you were a ham like me, you'd get in front of the camera for fun. So I was going to be Spike Lee before Spike Lee, Denzel before Denzel. <laughs> and God said, no. I have a, I'm just curious because I think this is so important. And you know this because you work with athletes. You have, you have, you know, you, your dad is, I think a lot of us have a burn inner burning question and drive that is, is really reflective of our unique path and only we know it, right? Like, so athletes feel yes. it. Coaches might get a sense of it, but sometimes it's like giving that freedom to that person because something inside them is telling them something. I'm just curious, what was inside of you that you, the stories that you wanted to tell? Well, I, I just wanted to be someone that uh, was a storyteller. And I thought that people on stage were storytellers. I thought, uh, being someone that could convey emotions and ideas and, 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 and make people feel things was something that I was really passionate about. And so it, it segued easily into 
wanting to be someone that created programs. And uh, it was no way that I thought that what I was doing would turn into an opportunity of a lifetime because it was an unbelievable opportunity to get a call to come and work with uh, uh, a university football program. And that segued into much, much, much more. Now, Greg, now that you've been doing this a minute, and this is almost a selfish question. It's funny. I have a daughter who's my youngest daughter is a junior in high school and she's a, she's a bright person. And um, she communicates a lot about being frustrated that people talk to her in a way that she's not as smart as she is. And I'm, I'm curious when you say, you know, good with working with young people, um, obviously when you started, you yourself were younger, but I'm, I'm also just curious how you continue to stay in touch as you get older and manage kind of your perception. And now you, you know, athletes coming in are younger and now they've got, you know, all different things that you didn't originally deal with, like social media. How do you keep developing those skills to connect to young people in the world that they come from? You treat them like they're your consultants. You treat them like they need to teach you how to communicate with them. You talk to them as though they are the smartest people in the room. <laughs> and you ask them for their advice and direction. I had the audacity to t uh, talk to a young person once. And I said, you know, first off, why don't you tell me who you are that's not related to your social media posts? And if I really wanted to know you as a real person, what would you tell me? What? I said, yeah, just tell me who you are aside from the hype and the glamour and the glory. And, and they were stunned and they had to struggle and they had to figure out how to describe themselves. And then I would listen to see if they said, well, I'm Gabby, I'm a volleyball player. And instead of saying, I'm Gabby, I'm the daughter of so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. I grew up in Lottie Dottie and like, I, I, I'm passionate about boom, boom, boom. So I would train them to talk about who you are in a different way. Then I would have the nerve to ask them if I wanted to be effective communicating with you, what would you recommend? Tell me how to talk to you. That just throws them off completely. But it gives them a chance to say, what would work talking to me? And so you make them coach you on how to talk to them. Do, do they know or is it take time? Because I would think that that's almost a skill that one would develop by practicing, because maybe if someone asked me first at this time in my life, I would know clearly, hey, the best way to communicate to me is this age. But at 18, when I'm playing college ball, I'm, it might have taken me a second to understand actually what my language was. And you give them that second and you teach them and you train them by asking questions. So what I do, people, I don't just tell people what to do or what to think. I, I pose question after question after question and try to learn from them. Who are you? Who do you want to be? What is your dream sequence? If you could create your ideal self, if you could design who you are and how your life was going to work, what would be the ingredients? Do they even at that young age, because obviously it's about success and performance on a field or a court, because then that would bring success either monetarily or for the security for their family, um, you know, attention. So they get pretty girls or boys like, you know, whatever the things are that we drive us. Um, do they talk about uh, relationships or like, do they start to add that into the formula as well or not yet? When I do a small group, I posed the question as to what are the indicators of individual success? And they come up with their own list. And in that list, it, it, it's easy for them to say, I want a big car. I want a big house. I want to make money. But I, Gabby, I swear to you, they go to, I want to achieve my personal goals. I want to be able to influence uh relationships and, and build relationships. And I want to be loved and I want to be cared for. I mean, it, and if they don't, I keep pushing until they do someone in the group. The, the most difficult part of my job is to trust the group, to believe that someone in that group is going to hit that note that one that, that makes the song right. 
and they always have somebody that says, excuse me, I, I just want to be happy. <laughs> Someone will say, I just want to be somebody that's respected by others. And then it opens the door for everybody to process because it's coming from the peer. The peer group is my most are my experts. And that's really beautiful, too, because it also opens the door. Uh, you hear this in Navy SEAL training in BUDS that um, when somebody, I don't want to say quits, but they go, they get up and ring the bell. And it's usually at sunset when they know that it's mm -hmm. going to be dark again. But they say that when the first person rings the bell, which means they tap out, that actually gives permission to the other guys mm -hmm. to do the same. So it, conversely, this is a positive thing where someone can be vulnerable or show a different type of goal and give permission to the others um, to give that permission. Are you able to, because we're not object, like when it comes to, to family, because that's always for me, like the high, you know, a different type of art form is you can be more objective with your athletes or if you're consulting a businessman, are you, do you have a secret about how you've learned how to do that as a father? Because, you know, I'm really smart when I'm objective. And when it comes to my own kids, man, I watch myself sometimes and I've really had to learn from a lot of years of parenting to even touch it once in a while. Wow. That, I mean, Gabby, you're fascinating. I, this, is, this is a very different conversation than I've had so far. And what we're talking about is how do I train myself to not just be worried and, and, and be try to be their buddy and their friend and their pal. You have to train yourself and practice training and rehearse saying no. <laughs> you have to practice training and rehearse giving them the problem and not just owning it yourself. I'm going to give my son the problem. I say, I will start off with, we've got a problem. <laughs> and uh, I'm pretty upset right now. Why do you think I'm upset? They know. <laughs> you know exactly why I'm upset. I say, explain to me why you think I'm upset right now. Well, I don't know. Well, if you don't know, it's okay. But I tell you what. I am not going to allow you to do anything until you communicate with me effectively. Oh, all right. So when giving an opportunity to gain something, for example, here's, you'll love this. Uh, you've got a teenager, right? Well, I have three daughters and two are, one's at the end of being a teenager. So she's sort of, I don't want to say in the clear, but we have a real clear, easy communication now. And mm -hmm. so I still have a junior. So she's just at the tail end of that, that little bit teenage style. Well, let's pretend they don't have their own car and they want to borrow your car. <laughs> right. <laughs> Mama, can I, I just want to take a ride. I want to pick up my friends and boom, boom, boom. And you say, well, let me think about it. Mom, no, I need to. I mean, you know, I already know. I need to, oh, so you don't want me to think about it? I, okay, then the answer is no. Then you. <laughs> and they, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, Mom. I said, well, then let me. I said, let me think about it. I have some questions for you. You know, but sometimes you have to say no, even though you know you want to surrender. You know you want them to have what they want. Every now and then, you got to take some lightweight things and practice. You have to practice. <laughs> Don't laugh. You no know, and not feel I'm laughing because and my husband, I have a, a daughter that really takes care of her business. Um, she, you know, she doesn't, I don't catch her in weird stuff on the weekends. She's not, I haven't caught her lying or, you know, drunk or, you know, any of this. And she takes school. I don't talk to her about her school. I don't talk. She gets really good grades. Like she takes care of her business. So, Usually when she's like on a Friday or Saturday and wants to go out, I'm like, yeah, go. Right. And, um, and remember, I think daughters are also a little different, um, than, than sons, but clearly. And, um, my husband would be like, you're saying yes. And I'm like, okay, but do you have a very good reason to say no? Because I have also found with daughters, for example, if you give them a no with no real reason, I always say then you can almost turn them into sneaky Pete's like they become kind of good liars. Mm -hmm. So yes. if on the if I try to be fair, but on the occasion I have to say no and I have reasons and I'll even share it to a degree. 
I find that they honor that because they know I'm trying to see it from their side. Yes, so yes. I think it is, you, that's an interesting thing about the light lift. Cause there are times that you, you just have to say no, when you talk to your athletes and then you say to them, Hey, what would be the most effective way to communicate to you? Were you able to ask your own children that and oblige that? Cause this for me is then you're now you're really talking about performance. If you're a parent who's so vested and you're able to talk to a family member, especially a child, and say, I'm going to really try to honor you here. Because um, you change their diaper, right? And it's you, you have to graduate with them. Are you, were you able to do that? One of my favorite, one of my favorite tools, um, I, I, uh, one time I was raising a, a young man who's not my biological, but, you know, I took him in and uh, yeah, he was so smart that um, instead of having a two point GPA be the standard for him to participate in sports, I said that he had to have a three point. Well, uh, he came home one day and he had a 2.7. And I said, well, obviously you don't want to participate in track and feel like you said you wanted to. Oh, but, and he said, well, you know, uh, look, I'm so sorry. But I said, no, we agreed that you would have a three point and you could participate. His coach calls me. Reese, his coach calls me. And he says, uh, excuse me, but uh, the GPA for sports is two point, And uh, you never shared with me uh, that yours was going to be different. And I, I said, what did you say? <laughs> Coach called me and asked me <laughs> to explain why <laughs> his GPA was different from everybody else's. And of course, I shared with him that he never asked me whether he should run 10 uh, 100s or, or, uh, or <laughs> I say, so that you don't negotiate with me about how you're going to run practice. Don't call me talking about how I'm going to run my household. This boy is a genius. And you may tolerate a 2.7 from him, but that's not my that's not my job. I say, so perhaps you should talk to him about his grades instead of trying to talk to me about your standard. Okay, that's part one. Part two was because I love the kid. I said, here's what we're going to do. You're going to make a presentation. This is a 16, 17-year-old. I say, you're going to present to me an overview as to why I should consider giving you an alternative and you'll also share with me in detail, you know, what your plans are to elevate your grades. Reese, this boy, <laughs> this boy made a present. It, it, they didn't have PowerPoints at the time. He got a, uh, what do you call it? Remember the old flip chart? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Your boy went and got a flip chart <laughs> and created you know, the pros and cons and boom, 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 and ex established as to what had happened, why it had happened, and how it would not happen again. The other trick I used, and that was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. And, you know, I had to surrender and let him run track. The other thing that I encourage anyone that's parenting or being responsible for someone, including an athlete, including a team, I would ask them to give me, there's going to be a punishment for what, what, what took place. So I would ask them, of course, give me your ideas of what you think would be appropriate. I need the least that could happen, the worst that could happen, and something in the middle. Gabby, their least would be worse than mine. <laughs> my God, these kids, I mean, they process, but you give them the responsibility of coming up with their idea of what should the punishment, what, if you could influence what I do next, I'm not saying I'm going to do what you, you come up with, but I want your ideas about what's the least that should happen because of this infraction. What's the worst that you think should happen? And, and sometimes it's far worse than what I would have come up with. And sometimes it's some so good that you let them have it. And that's teaching. 
That's right. Because they're part of the process. They've taken accountability. You know, I always say my coach in college was like always just really about personal accountability. Um, that's a really interesting um, strategy. I've done that a little bit as a parent. Um, okay. So I want to move now into the performance part. And first of all, what made you change? Did the coach call you and say, come on, Greg, we need you here. We need the football team need you. What was the switch? Did they, did they sort of say, no, we're going to give you a bigger um, opportunity to truly communicate with these athletes and impact them and not just, we're not just doing what we're supposed to do here. Absolutely. Gabby. What happened was I, I, they said, could we meet and, ch and chat? And of course I said, I'd be glad to. And I have 21 questions. I'll be there. Uh, and, and, and I need to review because it, it, I, if this is your drug program, this speech is on, this is what a drug program looks like to me. So if we're not talking about prevention, intervention, and retention, if you're not going to tell me what would happen to a young person if they raised their hand and said, oh, this is an amazing speech and I need help. If you can't tell me exactly what's going to happen with this kid, if you can't tell me how you're going to support this kid, then uh, we're going to have a problem. And so after giving them my idea of what a program would look like, the guy says, um, well, what would you like? I said, I need six sessions. He laughed <laughs> and said, I'll give you three. You're going to give me three sessions, which, uh, okay. And I don't need a group of 140 individuals. I need them in the smaller groups. And we'll talk to them about more than this is a drug and, <laughs> and this is what it does. He said, all right, I'll give you a shot. And I said, and this was uh, Bo Schimbeckler, one of the most famous uh, coaches of all time. Schimbeckler, I, I said, and, and sir, you and I will decide what I do in those sessions. It won't be me. It'll be me, you, and whatever experts you want involved. But I'm not going to come in and, 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 and fantasize that I, 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 I should be running this. We will do this together. I say, but most importantly, sir, what I would like for you to do is be the one that introduces me. And then I want to kick you and all the coaches out of the room. It is intimate. It's very intimate. And, and so I say, but most importantly, I didn't play in the NFL. I have zero credibility. You're going to give me instant credibility. He says, oh. Yeah. So he introduces me. And he gives them the riot that you're going to listen to this guy by get free and you're going to buy. And this is your, and I said, thank you, coach, for the introduction. Uh, would you now leave the room? Got it. And he walks out the door. Gabby, I turned to the group and I said, what just happened? They said, dang, <laughs> you must be the guy. <laughs> and that's how it started. What did you, after working with college athletes, because about 1% of them will play professionally and maybe in a program like Absolutely. that from one year to the next, maybe they have a really good, you know, group class that maybe more 2% goes, but typically it's about 1%, I would think. Um, and then I, what is the average career in the NFL? 3.2 years or something really insane. So NFL means not for long. Yeah, exactly. And so it's it's this interesting thing of you're really talking to them about developing their their full selves as human beings and all the hats that they wear. Maybe for young men, it's a student and a son and a friend and an athlete. Um, but you're you're saying in order to perform better on the field, which is you know the motivator at this point, you really have to be your best human. You have to perform the best that you can as a human being. How, what does that look like? All right. Buckle up. I had an athlete from the West coast of the United States who was, uh, whose family business was, um, uh, crime. And he was not a video make believe gangster. He was a real bonafide U S grade A choice. And but he had an amazing gift in in in, in his sport, and so uh, they brought him brought him in, and I couldn't understand why you would even recruit this kid. They said, you got to see how he plays. I said I got it. Well, he immediately was true to form, and 
and he immediately got in trouble and he immediately tested positive and he immediately uh, fought everybody on the team and he immediately rebelled against authority. So he had to sit with me a lot. <laughs> well, miraculously, somehow um, he started shifting and changing just enough to, you know, be eligible to stop being drawing attention to himself. And so that was a nice little story. And then about a year and a half, two years goes by, and he's not in trouble anymore. And it's and we bonded. And I'm all happy, happy, joy, joy. But he keeps coming. I can't get rid of him now because he, he's got a mentor. He's got an ally, an advocate. So one day he comes in and he says to me, uh, what are you doing, G? I said, I'm just sitting around waiting on you. What else would I be doing? He comes in, and unfortunately, it's summer, and I'm bored. That's not good. I say, my man, let me talk to you about something. You know, everybody here thinks you're dumb as a box of rocks, you know? He said, yeah, I know. I say, and you don't care, do you? Nah. I say, but you might be. He said, slow your roll, player. <laughs> I say, no, I'm not saying you are. I say, but we have no data. We have no evidence. Have you ever been a student? No. Nope. Have you ever committed to it? No. I say, I'm a, I say, we have nothing else to work on. Listen carefully. We're going to use academics to make you a better athlete. <laughs> you you, you got to be kidding me. I say, you've never heard anything like this. I say, no. I say, I try to teach you to give 100% in the book, 100% challenge, 100%, 100% of the time at everything you do. So what if we use that formula to, because you got to go to these classes and you trying to be eligible, it's got to be boring as all get out. I say, what if you turned yourself into a student so that you could practice, train and rehearse mental discipline, self-control, self-motivation? What if we use academics to transform your mind, how you think, shift your mindset to being able to give 100% of the stuff you don't even like? You're crazy. I say, yeah, but we got nothing else to do. So we work on it all summer and a little bit into the fall, and I forget about it. Nine months later, Gabby Reese, he walks into my office and says, gee, I said, what? I said, I'm on the Dean's list, fool! <laughs> Gab, I've had some great experiences. Mm. I've worked some, with some amazing human beings. We cried and we laughed and we giggled. We had the time. No one knew what was going on, but we were. he was ecstatic. He was beside himself with joy and the thrill of proving that he could do something that he didn't think he could do. So you, tra you train people to give 100% at the things they don't even like. And if they can train themselves to try to give 100% at th things you don't even like, what happens when they get to the things they love? Do you have to be a little bent, broken, something to prove to be really great? It doesn't even have to be negative, but I wondered if you – you ever sort of thought, uh, yeah, we got to have something in us. One of the things that you will notice is that some of your favorite athletes, some of your favorite entertainers, uh, 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 high performers are outliers. <laughs> outliers make it happen. You don't want to be like everybody else. You got to be a little bit off center to, for, for it appears uh, for a lot of people to make it to the next level. But you also open the door to talk about the four A's, which is a part of the book. The four A's are the need for attention. Everybody, anytime someone says every and all, they're about to say something deep or stupid. Everybody has the need for attention, approval, affection, and acceptance. Now, I've made a fool of myself. Pick one. Okay, pick two. Okay, all four. <laughs> and I've risen to the highest level of performance. Pick one. Pick two. 
All four of those can be part of your motive. They're motivating forces. The quest to have attention, to be recognized, to be seen, the need to be loved and cared for and, and, and have people like you, the need for the approval of others and get that paycheck on time. You work 40 hours, here's boom, boom, boom. But ultimately, what do we want? Acceptance. Yeah. And so we are driven by the four A's. But we, we also get to the point where we have to teach people at the end of the day, there are people who you know, Gabby, that are the best at giving other people attention, affection, approval, and acceptance, but they're not good at giving it to themselves. So in the book, we get you to the point where we talk about self-love and self-acceptance as one of the secrets that's not a secret. But we also take you to, you covered so much with your question. You fascinate me. You ready for this? You also brought up fear. The greatest enemy you have ever faced in your life is fear and self-doubt. <laughs> You've had all kinds of opponents in your life. But if the one, in, if the greatest competition we have ever faced is between your ears. After injury, recovering, all the things that you've had to do to keep going, define age, define everything, and be pushing through and, and, and conquering the world over and over, conquering the world in your own dome. That's the challenge. So what we begin to teach anyone that will listen is that instead of telling people don't be afraid, we teach them stop being afraid of being afraid. Do you think through time, like this is the other thing that I, I, I wonder if you have this conversation with athletes, like what athlete have you sort of worked with over the longest period of time, maybe from a college athlete to a professional? Desmond Howard. Okay. So you know how, um, I always say we have to change our motivation a little bit, I believe, because we grow up, we're different. Um, the expectations are different. The responsibilities usually are greater. Um, and we can't be like mad about our dad or our mom or something. I think after we get to a certain point, I think we have to change our motivation. Do you have conversations with an athlete? Let's use Desmond Howard as an example. He also seems like a pretty happy guy where it's like, well, wh what's your new why? You know, getting athletes to kind of reassess and reestablish a new why. Well, what we do, and remember, this book is not about athletes. This is about everyone, everyone in our lives who want to upgrade to be peak performers in whatever is important to them. Uh, but think about this. If your programming is to give 100%, 100% of the time at everything you do, we just switch the focus. We Because... If, if, if I'm going to be in radio, television, and film, I got to be the best. If I'm going to go and write a book, I got to be the best. If I'm going to become a parent, I want to be the best at it that I can be. If I'm, if I decide I'm going to marry you, I'm, <laughs> I've got to be committed. And so some people have to be reminded to train themselves to always give their absolute best at everything they're doing. And some folks don't. You talk about that. Well, you know, we're inherently lazy. It's almost like we have to have a game plan to follow because I, I think it is hard every day to get up and be like, here we go. I just think there's a couple people that have a interesting, you know, mechanism. But even the great, a lot of great performers, CEOs, whoever, people think, oh, it's easy for them. And I don't think they realize that they just have put a system in place so that they can, they can show up. Here's a great example. There are days when Gabby doesn't want to work out. <laughs> and those days, Gabby has a routine. I know this is what I do. There'll be days I have no interest in working out. Yesterday, I got all the excuses. Within, I'm, and So what I'll do is I'll put on that gear. So at least I'll put on the clothes. Once I put on those clothes, the transformation begins. I don't know what it is, but get putting on my workout gear. I said, well, I, I can at least do a little bit today. I do a little bit. Next thing you know, well, 
I might as well do a little more. <laughs> well, since I'm doing it, I might as well do it right and, and give everything I've got. And even though it was a struggle, once it's over, the sense of accomplishment is unbelievable because I didn't want to do anything, but I had what you said, an organized, disciplined routine. I'll at least put on the clothes and maybe I'll take a walk. Well, since I'm walking, I'm warmed up. Well, I might as well lift a little bit, <laughs> but it opens up that door. People have to, you know, we always say in our house, there's only one first day. And I think sometimes if we've gotten really behind, if we can just do the first day, there's only one of those, right? And we can build upon um, and putting that uniform on. In your in your book, um, and, and now branching away a little bit from athletics is you, you mentioned stop being afraid of being afraid, where it's like, yeah, I of course, who wouldn't be afraid? Why wouldn't I feel that way? Of course I feel that way. And that's okay. Um, and you talk about, Focusing on control, the controllables. This is a big one. Yes, it is. Because it talks about who's got control over your mind. Who's got, you, you've got to stop. We have to stop letting anyone else decide how I feel about myself. That's the one thing I have control of. There's a lot I cannot control. But how I feel about me, <laughs> how you feel about you. That has to be under your control. How you respond and how you react to chaos and difficulty and challenges. That's your decision. No one, no one can make you feel inferior without your permission. You know, let's say a kid, you deal with, like you said earlier, a story. You deal with, um, and again, I'm just using the athlete as an example, but people d deal with, they grew up in a household where nobody said, you know what, you can do it. Or you're smart, or uh, you know I believe in you. So, do you have? Is there ways or tools that you give people? Because it's almost like rewiring your inner language and your your brain almost. Gabby, stop! <laughs> you know you nailed it. You you train people to their inner voice. Again, if the enemy within can't stop you, nothing can. And so when we talk about fear and self-doubt, when we're talking about negative self-talk, we train, we can't, we teach people to document how often that negative thought attacks. It's a fascinating piece. I've, I've given people a little bitty notebook and say, every time your negative a voice shows up, jot it down and catch yourself. And, and now the first thing I've got to tell you, you're going to be stunned at how often that voice shows up. Don't get upset and have negative self-talk about your negative self-talk. <laughs> Stop! Don't beat yourself up. I need you to be fascinated by how often it shows up. And now, we, and then after that, we're going to train you to not only document it and catch it, we're going to reduce how often it comes and how long it lasts. We are deliberately and intentionally going to listen to how I talk to myself, how I beat myself up, how I worry about things I can't control. And I'm going to deliberately shift and let it trigger a new habit. What is so interesting and so simple and really so difficult is just what you said, which is it's almost like apologizing or, um, being like, oh yeah, there's that voice. The minute that we stop running from whatever the the thing is, it does diminish and get smaller. And yes. and even be like, oh, I think that's why meditators in some ways have a different advantage because you know we're not our thoughts, and they just go, oh look, there's that thought and this thought. And people don't realize, to your point, if you practice this a little bit, just observing it, yes. You depower that thing so much very quickly. And I really ap appreciate that point because a lot of people, we're all walking around, you know, chirping inside our heads. And um, this is, is the number one thing I think that hurts a lot of us. It does. That inner voice has to be, it has to be trained to give you the affirmations, to be confident, to be assertive in your commitment to loving yourself. See what, and it sounds so simple, but you have to get to the point where self-love 
and self-acceptance is the cornerstone that you're building off of. I don't, I, I hope people like me. I hope you like me. But if you don't, I'm going to be okay. I'm confident and clear about that. What we're also trying to teach people is to get to the point where they become the world's greatest expert on one subject, themselves. They know their strengths and their weaknesses better than anyone. And some of my weaknesses might be how I talk to myself and to identify that that's one of my patterns I would need to change. And let, and, and, and let me close by getting you to this point. You ready? Yeah. The only creature I ever heard of that can decide they're not going to be the same today as they were yesterday is a human being. A dog going to be a dog, a lion going to be a lion, but a human being is the only creature I ever heard of who could deliberately and intentionally decide to change. If I don't like something that I see in the mirror, I can do something about it. And if I can't do it by myself, I can ask for help. So people will see, you know, a guy like Tom Brady or Michael Phelps and think, oh, you know, they're just great. They're just great. You know, they have the things to be great. They have the physical, they have the mental, emotional, the drive. Um, are there things though that is it, is there secret sauce that goes into athletes like this where we as just sort of everyday you know, householders could be like, oh, I could implement a little bit more of that and be more dynamic or more, you know, I could perform at a higher level. Um, let's be real clear. What The, the question is kind of like, what's the difference between these amazing humanoids and the rest of us? Well, the difference is that not only are they hungry, they're humble which makes them coachable. Right. Tom Brady, clearly, if you just look at his body type, he can't outrun you, he can't outjump you, he can't outlift you, but you can't catch him. <laughs> Wait a minute, what's the difference? The difference is you can measure how much he can bench, you can measure how high he can jump, how fast he can do a 40, but you can't measure this and you can't measure his heart. I guess I want to just ask if uh, fun, if fun also, if you encourage people to make fun a part of, imp there's two things, fun a part of in performance. And there's something you said that I think is very important that I don't want to miss. You talk because you go, oh, I'm a CEO. I'm a football player. I'm a star, whatever. And you're saying, that's great, but your identity, I'm trying to make you perform as good as good as you can in this environment, but yet that's not who you are. Your self-worth and self-esteem must not be based on performance. How I feel about me, Gabby, you have lost contests that you knew you were gonna win. And you had to decide you not you hate losing, but you don't hate yourself. <laughs> I mean, we lost. Um I, um mm, but next. The ability to understand how to let go of yesterday's baggage is part of an art form. How being able to, if you're afraid to fail, you're afraid to succeed. And that's what we teach anyone that'll listen. I love that. And what about fun? Is it important or is it just grind? Okay, look, look, I'm going to get in trouble. You ready? Because this is not a, a two second answer. I know I got to go, but listen carefully. Can you imagine trying to convince a hockey player to have fun? <laughs> now, when they were 13, 14, and 15, they were having fun. But now I'm in college, and now I'm in the NHL. And you mean have fun. I had this kid who had the audacity, and it takes you back to another part of your question. And it's like, you know, how do you get people to 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 really own own everything? And I had a, a kid who was just like Tom Brady who says, the coaches don't believe in me. I don't think the coaches like me. And I said, you, you didn't come here to be liked. <laughs> and why should your coach believe in you if you don't believe in yourself? The hockey player says to me, hockey's not funny anymore. <laughs> the coach is taking all the fun out of the game. I say, so you're telling me 
Well, I mean, wait a minute. How old is your coach? Huh? I don't know, 45, 55. Sure, what's the likelihood of your coach changing? Uh, zero. I say, so then you're telling me you're giving someone's personality power over how you feel. Her? I say, so you're giving this person whose personality sucks by your standard permission to make you unhappy? I say, bro, you don't understand power. You don't understand power, and you certainly don't understand control the controllables. Where we have to take you is like, this is what we're going to do. Now, you know, I don't know jack about hockey. Yeah, I know you don't. I say, all right, this is what you're going to do. I want you to piss off everybody on your team at practice today. What? I, say, I want you to have more fun than anyone on the ice. No one is to enjoy practice more than you. You're going to confuse your coach. You're going to confuse your teammates. And you're going to have a ball. And then when the next game comes, I want you to have more fun than anybody on the ice because it's fun to be the king fool. (laughs) He said, you're crazy. I said, try it out. This is a true story. He goes to practice. He does it. People think something's wrong with him. And I said, you're going to be an outlier, my friend. (laughs) And everybody else all intense and tight and tense and all up and you're going to be out there flowing having a great time okay it goes on a couple of days they have the game it goes the next few games things are getting better three games later later he has a hat trick that means he scores three times in a hockey game which is a major accomplishment now his father who was a pro hockey player who had told him this guy didn't know what he's talking about, telling you to go have fun, calls me and tells me, boy, I don't know what you did. <laughs> but my son is so happy and enjoying himself. Of course, the kid that I'm talking about is in the NHL and doing extremely well. Well, I think that's it. It's a grind. It's a, it's a, it's a commitment, but it's also re- enjoying the pro- that whole process. So Greg Harden, thank you for your time. The book is Stay Sane in an Insane World. And um, I appreciate that you're also still having fun. Thank you. Oh, you can tell. <laughs> you you already know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gabby. Your questions were outstanding. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Bye. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you want to learn more, there is a ton of valuable information on my website. All you have to do is go to GabrielleReese.com or head to the episode show notes to find a full breakdown with helpful links to studies, research, books, podcasts, and so much more. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and send them to at Gabby Reese on Instagram. And if you feel inspired, please subscribe. I'll see you next week. This podcast is brought to you by Laird Superfood. In 2015, Laird Superfood was created, but it was really actually created in my kitchen by my husband, Laird. And he was always experimenting with coffees and other ingredients for performance. And lo and behold, Laird Superfood was born. And we have beautiful coffees and creamers and protein bars and other things. But one of the things I'm very excited about is our new greens product. A lot of Americans are not getting enough fruits and vegetables. Something like 85% are not getting enough vegetables and 80% are not getting enough fruit. And we need fiber. So for me personally, I'm always trying to encourage people, and I know this is Laird's philosophy as well, is real food, right? Let's try to get as much of the good stuff, the minerals, the nutrients, the macro, the micronutrients from real food. But it's hard to do. Our soil's different. People are busy. Maybe you don't know what you're getting at your grocery store. So this is a way to get it done and bridge some of those nutritional gaps. And what I also really appreciate about it, besides that it tastes good, I just do it in water first thing in the morning, then I'm done. And then I actually go and have my coffee after, but we use upcycled fruits and veggies. So things that won't go to waste, maybe they're not really pretty. So we use them in our fruits and veggies. We use no fillers. So your body actually knows what to do with the ingredients. They know how to absorb it. There's fiber. And also, we never use any artificial or natural flavors. Uh, This is something that is harder than people realize because to amplify flavors, a lot of times even, you know, using natural flavors is the way to do it. So I'm excited to share with you. And if you'd like to try it out, all you have to do is go to LairdSuperfood.com. And if you punch in the code Gabby, G-A-B-B-Y, 20, you will receive 20% off.